support innovation. I'm really pleased to welcome you to this session around understanding consumer demands and focusing on summer fruit. Um, we are recording this session, so we know there's some folks who may not be able to make it, so just noting that this session will be recorded. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the country countries on the land in which we join you from today. Um, I'm here in Sydney, so uh, Kamaral uh, lands, and I acknowledge traditional owners and their um, leaders past, present and emerging. Um, we're going to hear from our subject matter as expert today, Patrick Fry. Patrick's a, a, the, a partner of growth strategy at Cantar, a leading Australian strategy house with brand and consumer expertise, both here in Australia and internationally. And Pat's going to talk you through the methodology and results of this study and help you understand how to read the 2,000 plus pages of reporting um, and how to make sense for you in summer fruit. Um, while Pat's presenting, my suggestion is that we turn ourselves to mute and take our cameras off. But when we've got questions, please raise your hand, um, turn your microphone on, turn your camera on and ask those questions, or alternatively put the questions in the chat. I'm going to make a, a, a strange apology up front that I can't stay for the full presentation, but my colleague Jade Curley will work with Pat to get you right through to the end of this presentation. Um, some very interesting insights coming from this consumer-led approach. and. Without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you, Pat, and um, I think we'll kick off. Great, thank you. I'll just share my screen then and you can let me know when you can see this. Um, I'll put it on presentation mode even. Yeah, thanks, Pat. We can see that. Great. Okay. Right, so today we're going to cover really three things. There's also an appendix that, that you can refer to, but I'll give you a bit of background and objective to the study and, um, and why we did this. Uh, I'll focus a little bit or quite a lot actually on the market prioritization, which is a really important element of the study because it's really the, 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 nut, the nuts and bolts of how we put it together and determine where you can find growth opportunities for the commodities. Uh, we'll then focus on in this case, summer fruits, uh, there's a whole section. So these reports are structured. There are three different reports, fruits, vegetables, and nuts. And you can see that uh, each commodity has their own, uh, each, each section, uh, they get their own dedicated section. So there's lots of detail here. And then the appendix that you have access to has got uh, all the detail again. So we've reported as much as we possibly can. But here today, I'll just share with you, um, I think the key things and hopefully give you enough uh, to be able to navigate your way through the reporting. So, um, so let's start with the background. So yeah, the, um, the disruption of COVID obviously was large and Australia's ability to export was, was hugely impacted. So Hort Innovation proactively initiated and invested in several critical projects. Uh, this started with a, some work carried out by Deloitte, uh, which identified 13 markets uh, that offered growth potential. So this study um, uses that as a foundation and then uses the 13 markets that we inherited. And uh, we built on that, uh, looking at uh, providing an in-depth understanding of consumption in these critical markets. So really looking at the consumer view, uh, because that was really the big gap in our understanding uh, and the genesis of this. And it's really to identify export growth opportunities for commodities of interest uh, and, and the ones that you've seen uh, we've chosen. So the Deloitte report, many of you may have seen them, but you can have access to those. Um, there's lots of detail around the metrics that went into those to, to choose the markets. It's interesting to note that 12 were selected initially, uh, but India, which uh, ranked 17th, was actually added later because it was deemed to have uh, some growth opportunity that didn't um, immediately appear when we looked at these third party data sets. And certainly from the data that sets that we've captured, uh, that was a good decision because India does indeed represent a significant opportunity. So the central question, and this is our North Star that we always have one of these uh, with these big programs to help guide what we do throughout. But in this case was how can Australian horticultural industries unlock growth by generating consumer demand for different categories across different international markets for today and tomorrow? And the important thing is tomorrow there, we're really challenged with finding a future lens of where we need to go from this point onwards uh, so that we could open up uh, profitable opportunities. So the objective of the study was to provide a consumer-led perspective, uh, as I said, on the export opportunity for Australian horticulture. And so the work unpacked consumer attitudes and values, uh, as well as their fresh produce shopping behaviour, 
how they consume fruits, vegetables and nuts across the different uh, 13 different markets. Uh, it provides a strategic lens on which markets represent the most attractive opportunity for each of the commodities uh, in turn, and it identifies which commodities have the strongest right to play in each market. So this is really all about optimising export and product positioning today and into the future so that we can drive growth and hopefully facilitate the deployment of effective and coordinated trade marketing resources so that we can um, better apply investment um, across markets for certain commodities. Now, the approach was a four-stage one. Uh, I won't go into detail, but broadly, we started with an audit and discovery phase. We then moved into an in-depth uh, cultural phase where we, looked, we asked experts about the, the market to give us an understanding of what the structure and what the dynamics were and help us to build the survey uh, which was step three, which is where we developed the growth plan. And this was based off large sample surveys across those 13 markets. So mostly we had N equals 4,000, uh, where we captured 8,000 consumption occasions. Some markets like Qatar, there was 500, just small and harder to get, but a very large sample across the piece. And now we're in stage four, which is lining and embedding, which is uh, lots of these types of workshops so that you can have a chance to see how it all fits together and a chance to ask questions as we go. So just a reminder of the markets. So USA, UK, Singapore, India, as I mentioned, was thrown in. Japan, Hong Kong, South Korea, Malaysia, UAE, Qatar, Taiwan, Vietnam and Indonesia. And you'll note China was uh, actually excluded and that was intentional because the study was intended to look at um, export opportunities beyond China. So that's why it's not in here. And here is the, the span of what we actually covered. And today we're gonna to focus on summer fruits, which included peaches, nectarines, plums, and apricots. So we, we grouped those together uh, for the sake of trying to capture more uh, across the study. But you can see it had to cover quite a large breadth. So um, that's what we've done. And these are the 13 fruits that are included in the fruit study. And as I mentioned earlier, there are three overall category reports. So one for fruits, one for vegetables, and one for nuts. And then I should also say that off the back of these, there are 13 specific market reports. So these are um, intended to be the entry point for the study so that you can see the background, which I'll cover a bit here, go to your section that's relevant to you, and it will identify the key markets that might be of interest. And then if you're interested in a particular market, whether it be Indonesia, Vietnam, you can then go and look at that, those market reports and they have lots more information uh, about consumer dynamics, et cetera. Um, so but today we're going to focus on the, on the category because that's really the starting point for the study. So importantly, the market prioritisation. So the objective of this is to determine from mostly consumer perspective which markets represent the strongest growth opportunities for Australian exports. And this is based on things like usage, Australian appeal and the ability to command a price premium or command a premium. We also added in some other factors as well. So the primary research from this was consumer, but we used some of the metrics from the Deloitte reporting and third party like supply chain, regulatory environment, ease to market, uh, to help make this a holistic view. So that it means that you don't have to actually go back and refer to other reports, it's all in here. Uh, so that's packed into the calculus that I'll share with you in a minute. And these are the, the metrics that we use, or the dimensions, I should say, and I'll, I'll talk to you in quite some detail about how they were constructed so that you can understand what, um, what goes on under the hood of the car. So firstly, firstly, we evaluate things by attractiveness. So how attractive is the consumer opportunity in a market for a commodity? And then addressability, which is how addressable is the consumer opportunity for, in a market for a commodity? So how hard or easy is it to go after? And in terms of attractiveness, the three key metrics that went into calculating this for all the markets was firstly penetration. So that's how often uh, do you consume a commodity was one of the questions. So this is indicative of size. Obviously, the bigger, the better. Likelihood to pay a premium, um, which is the willingness to pay premium for a specific commodity. And this really, you know, once again, the bigger, the better, because there's a price uh, obviously upswing there. And then finally, market access. You'll note there are weightings here. So there were 30%, 40%, 30%. They add up to 100. And that's what went into the calculation of whether a market is attractive or not for a commodity. And just on that third one, market access, I just want to go into a bit more detail there because um, it was, it's an important element in calculating whether a market is attractive or not. 
And in here, there are three dimensions. So the first one is import dependency. So that includes things like three-year average value of imports, consumption share of production, 10-year change in value of imports. So that tells us where the higher the value, it indicates that there's a greater reliance on imports and sustained growth, so good for attractiveness. Second one is the future economic prospects. And this is um, yeah, future looking in terms of things like GDP. So that was GDP per capita between 2020 and 2030 and urban population uh, between the same period. So that means higher values demonstrate larger higher income markets, which is also good to contribute to attractiveness. And then thirdly, preference advantage. So this included metrics like the quality of the demand do horticultural imports in a country align with Australian exports? And is the country in the Northern Hemisphere? Seasonality comes into this. So higher rankings demonstrate greater potential for Australian horticulture to differentiate itself in a market. So obviously the higher, the, the, the better it is for attractiveness. And then the second dimensional factor uh, is addressability. And what went into that calculation? Once again, the three metrics, 30%, 40%, and 30%. The first one is likelihood to purchase Australian. So the question was, which would you be most likely to buy and import for Australia? The second uh, input there, the ability to command a premium. So how willing would you be to pay more for a premium quality, in this case, summer fruit? Uh, and then market access, there's some addressability elements there. And the things that go into addressability were two things. First of all, ease of trade and country risk. And that included things like the foreign competition index, uh, existing existence of free trade agreements or whether they're in negotiation, political stability and WTO dispute. So where they were ranked higher, a country, indicate the lower cost of doing business and reduce risk of market disruption from political risk. So obviously the higher rankings there made it more addressable. Uh, the second dimension there then is the value chain competitiveness. And that included things like relative distance to market. Obviously the further away, the harder to address. Um, also port transport infrastructure index. Uh, and then the Australian horticulture import price relative to country average. So where countries ranked higher, demonstrates greater potential for Australian horticulture to differentiate itself. So once again, higher, the rankings more addressable for the market. So we throw all that into, into a mix and we come up with a matrix uh, many of you might be familiar with. Um, so let me just give you a quick rundown of this and how to read it. Uh, the important thing to note is that this is all relative. So we've taken these 13 markets which have been identified previously as, as markets of interest. And then using all of the metrics that I've just shared with you, we, we look at the relativities such that where countries um, are for a particular commodity are more addressable or attractive, they would obviously land in a strategic priority where they have the strongest overall consumption export opportunity. Uh, and this broadly means that were you to invest in these markets, um, you're more likely than other markets to get a high return on investment. You might have to spend less getting in there. The consumption appetite is higher and you're likely to generate more of a premium. So that's why it will land in the top box. If we stay on the right of this matrix, um, anything that's less attractive and more addressable, we would term low hanging fruit, which is it tends to be easy to go after or relatively, but you just may not get the same return on investment, but nonetheless can be a good short term opportunity. Then when you look at the left side of the matrix, at the top left, where markets uh, represent, and the data suggests a highly attractive market, uh, this would represent something that you should look at uh, as an interest, but it just may, given the addressability is lower, it might be that it just takes longer to go after, investment's a bit higher, and the return on investment might not be as high, um, but worth thinking about and worth contemplating. And that's why it lands there. But if, some, if something, particularly is or a market is not very attractive or addressable, not surprising that it's low priority. I would say that it's important to note that none of these markets uh, are off the cards, uh, as in all of these markets represent an opportunity and that's what the previous research had showed. But what this is saying that from a consumer point of view, predominantly, the data suggests that by going for markets that are closer to the top right of this quadrant, you're more likely to get a high return on investment quicker. So we're, we're suggesting that this data says that in the near future, 
and even the medium term future, the markets that are strategic priorities are probably the best chance you've got of success. But nonetheless, none of these markets are, are off the cards, so please keep that in mind. So in some of the earlier sharing of the data and working through this, so um, we work very closely with Hort Innovation and the PRG group, which was made up of a range of experts that were provided uh, who were really helpful in, in shaping this whole study. There was clearly it, it, questions came up, in that, meaning that we should uh, articulate sort of four considerations. So and I'll share them in a minute, but the first one is existing technical market access. There's con considerations around uh, markets with existing trade the premium opportunity, and finally, the, the focus of investment. So in terms of existing technical market access for a commodity, it was intentionally not included in the evaluation of addressability. And the rationale for this is that the project was designed to identify attractive and addressable future growth geographies. Therefore, the analysis is not restricted to current arrangements. So we really just didn't want to be tied into today. We wanted to give that future uh, perspective. And so this research is then intended to support and inform industry decisions regarding the progress of any future or ongoing market access negotiations or market improvement requests. So it's really about a future focus rather than being uh, uh, just tied into what we've got today. The second one is uh, markets with existing trade. So while addressability calculation includes data on general market access and trade, it intentionally does not include whether Australia currently trades in a particular commodity. Um, and Japan is a particular one that comes up and, and it will come up again here and, and we can talk about that. But the reason we did that is because the goal of this analysis was to provide an objective assessment of whether a market is attractive and addressable, independent of current arrangements or, or, or where you're currently playing. So it might be that you're in a market because things once upon a time were, uh, were such, but what this was intended to do was use the data from today and look at where the future might go. So bear that in mind. So what that means is that if a market that you're currently trading in today uh, is not shown to be a strategic priority, it does not mean that you should consider withdrawing from this market. However, it does mean that we recommend re-evaluating the relative focus of investment in this market and also consider other markets when looking at future growth opportunities. So. In the case of Japan, it might be that you, you, know, you do have uh, relatively good arrangements right now, but relative to other markets, the data would suggest that maybe there are other markets to go after, which is an exciting prospect, and that's where the future is going. But just the final point I would say, and we've had this conversation with some of the commodities around uh, the premium opportunity. So in, in evaluating attractive and addressable export markets, we've intentionally uh, used data that shows where premium opportunities can be found. So this is so that we find areas where you get a price premium, not just a, a volume play. Because the overall objective was to, provide, to identify profitable growth opportunities for the future. So Australian commodities will have more chance of growing profitably, where there's a better chance of commanding a premium, simply put. So high commodity penetration in a market has also been used in evaluation, but the analysis favours where there's a larger opportunity for a premium. So bear that in mind. And then finally, the focus of investment. And the evaluation and prioritisation of export markets uh, is intended to be only one input into decision making about where to focus. And yes, certainly for some of commodities, there's some uh, specific market intelligence that we wouldn't have access to that, that isn't in here. And we encourage you to use that type of thing. But the reason we, we didn't, and the reason we're pointing this out is that the objective of the project was to primarily use a consumer lens and while we have used other things from the Deloitte data, um, we're, we're really using an objective um, data-driven approach with as much data as we could uh, get our hands on and have access to. But what this means is that your export decisions should be made using all available information. So that includes the economies of local growers and exporters and certainly where you have favourable commercial terms. Uh, that will be things that we haven't included here, but please take that into account. So this report should form one input into that decision-making process, and we hope that it's going to get you a long way there, but please use all uh, available data if you've got some stuff that uh, is not included here. So I just might pause there for a moment um, just to see if there's any questions or comments before I, I, share, um, I share the outcome of the work. Thanks, Pat. Um, so if anyone's got any questions, um, you could 
use the raise hand function or turn your camera on and wave at me or chuck your microphone on and just have a bit of a yell if um, as Pat's explained the methodology and the background or if there are no questions or comments at the moment. Pat, I think we'll keep moving. Okay, well without further ado, um, I will share with you the, the outcome, which is here. Um, so for uh, summer fruits, when we threw all the data, which I'll, and I'll share some with you in a minute, into that calculation that we talked about, um, quite a decent spread here, but what's clear is that the, there are three markets, Indonesia, India and the UAE, that come up as strategic priorities. Malaysia also on the cusp there, so highly addressable. In fact, the second most addressable, uh, according to our data. Singapore is also very addressable, but far less attractive for reasons that I can explain if you want me to go into the detail. Vietnam also interesting, once again, on the cusp, um, really on the, on the cusp of addressability, but very attractive. So in the top four when it comes to attractiveness. And Qatar, Taiwan also near the middle there, closely followed by Hong Kong. Uh, USA, um, it appears a lot in this position across the different commodities. Uh, very attractive, but not very addressable. And that's really driven by uh, distance to markets a long way away. There's tariffs, the local markets for many of these commodities is very good. And also the export or import from countries like Canada and South America, Mexico, uh, Central American countries, also very strong. So uh, it's just a bit harder to go after the USA. Um, and in UK as well, it sits in that camp. And interesting for this commodity, Korea and Japan um, finished quite low down there. So generally now I've, I've paused at this moment because this is sort of the reveal. And I'm curious to get some uh, opinion on whether this is surprising or if you have any questions about particular geographies, because we've got all the data uh, at our fingertips to share with you and we can, com we can have a conversation about that. So yeah, I'll, I'll leave it to the floor to have any questions or comments. Again, if anyone's got any thoughts or questions. Love. Any, su any surprises or uh, does this all make sense? Um, go for it, Charlotte. Yeah, go for I it, Charlotte. Like, go for it. <laughs> I'll just chime in here and, and say that um, I think most people would be surprised by India and the UAE. I think a lot of people are quite... Um, I guess, uh, a little bit tentative about, t you know, um, dipping their toe into the Indian market because, well, the, um, you know, perceived or real issues about payment and also, um, you know, about supply chain, cool chain problems there. That's a, a good point, Charlotte, and I reckon, Pat, what might be useful is if you maybe explore a couple of the figures of why, from a consumer-led approach, um, attractive and accessibility puts that puts those markets right in that top corner, um, mm -hmm. and and perhaps refer to some of Charlotte's points. So it might also be a bit of a converse, Charlotte. If if for example, um, folks were interested in why Japan or Korea were down in the bottom left hand side, um, you might be able to see this in the the next set of figures. And um, if Pat, if you could go through that, because um, the full report of what's what as of how Patrick's actually working through this is available to all of you. But this will help you understand how to dissect the um, the slides yourself when you're looking at that. So perhaps um, to Charlotte's question of why did UAE and India end up so high? Yeah, it's a good question, and um, it's a good segue into an explanation of the metrics because we've given you the, the reports include all the data, so you can work it out. Um, and this is where, you know, there are some local things like just bad experience locally might taint your view as to what you do. But nonetheless, this would suggest, so this question is a consumer view, purely consumer view. So what we're seeing is that UAE has, in this case, the highest claim consumption. So, you know, they, they like summer fruits in UAE, according to this. And India is not far behind, uh, one in three. So you can see how that compares to some of the geographies. So... Those two met this question represents 30% of the calculation that goes into attractiveness. The next one is the willingness to pay a premium for a uh, quality summer fruit. And we can see here that um, actually UAE 44% and 
and India is in the top four and, and half. So people are saying, yep, they'd be willing to pay more for it. So once again, from consumer point of view, uh, they're willing to pay more for a quality summer fruit in uh, in India and UAE in both these markets, particularly compared to, to the UK, Japan, which we saw uh, ended up in the bottom there. And finally, uh, market access. So this is how, and, and this is where, as you saw before, we have included some of those metrics that you talked about around access. Um, and once again, this was this was put through the, the calculus from the original Deloitte reports. And what we can see here is that the UAE and India actually don't do too badly. Um, and according to the, the metrics from the Deloitte work, um, market access for India is, is number four and actually not far behind the top. Um, and UAE is around about the middle. So um, you can kind of see how we've tried to use some of those, those metrics that you talked about around access. But there's also other market access in addressability, so I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but when we come to addressability, we've got... This is the likelihood to buy summer fruits from Australia. And once again, you can see that Indonesia is very, very high, but India and UAE also very high. So compared to other geographies, there's a real appetite for Australia here. And we see this across a lot of the commodities. So how open are you to Australia? And this is very high relative to others. And then your willingness to pay a premium um, overall is middle for India uh, or about, about on the index. And then, uh, well, similarly for UAE. So these are all very, very similar, actually. It's just that Qatar at one end is very low and uh, the UK is high. But, um, but that's pretty good, like when you, when you look at it uh, relative to others. So that's another reason why it's up the top. And then here's the other market access around addressability. And um, UAE and India do come down here a bit. Um, but nonetheless, it's some of those other metrics that, um, that have given it quite a high weight. Um, and so that whilst that addressability is down, the other metrics do do buoy it up. So hopefully that gives you a bit of a sense that we've we've tried to use as much data as possible. That if you felt that um, for your from your circumstances or you know the experience that you've had, uh, there might be a heavier weighting to this. I you know you can make that mental calculation and that might um, I guess guide what markets you yourself prioritise. Because certainly, if you're if, if you're not willing to to embrace a, a market where you've had uh, you know bad experiences in the past, that can obviously have a have an opinion. But this is based on data from Deloitte Access, and so that's how we've came up with it. So we tried to be as transparent and as objective as possible in all of these, so that you can make these decisions or export decisions based on as much objective and robust data as possible. So hopefully, that helps you guide you through how you might be able to come up with the calculations. So if I go back to the chart now, um, you can see that yeah, India and, and UAE, the addressability is lower than some of those other ones, but they are very, very attractive. And we saw that was driven by um, penetration and also willingness to pay premium. So um, very attractive in that regard. Thanks for that question, Charlotte, because it does allow Patrick to explain the, the the like. There's a lot more richness of data behind that. So if you had a, a you know a slightly different viewpoint, you can then come back to this um, summary slide here and have a bit of an idea of why the 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 size of the bubble, but also where it fits on the attractiveness addressability scale. Mm -hmm. Right. Thanks, Mila. Thanks, Patrick. Um, Patrick, we have a question in the chat. Was the demand for organic fruit considered? Uh, yeah, so where organic comes in, you'll see it later in the deck where it's uh, it was in, does that drive premium? Uh, so hopefully that will be answered when we get to that point, which is we asked around, you know, what would you pay a premium for? And organic um, was a, a feature. And certainly in many geographies and across many commodities, organic uh, was definitely a driver of premiumness. So we'll we'll see that when we get to it. Thanks, Pat. Um, so while we're on this summary slide, if there's more questions, please put your hand up or pop them in the chat. Um, we will um, uh, make sure we answer them. We can come back to them if, if you're, you're still thinking on it. And I'll just note that um, Jade has put the link to all of the reports. So um, all the category reports for fruits, vegetables and nuts. And then each of the individual markets has their own report. So the link is in there. Please register um, uh, to access those. Um, but if there's no more questions at this stage, we might get you to keep moving, Pat. Carry on. Okay. Carry on. Let's go. Let's go. So we've, we've now managed to cover this. So um, 
yeah, please comb over the detail, and hopefully you can um, you can kind of get a sense of why things are where they uh, where they landed on the chart. But um, just noting, this has all been reviewed by you know, various PAG members and, and Horn Innovation. So um, the feedback so far from those uh, matrices is that uh, they're making sense mostly. Uh, there's a few uh, interesting outliers, as you've pointed out, Charlotte. Um, but this is a data-driven approach, and we tried to be as um, objective and transparent as possible. So, um, so yeah, but please uh, question all, all you like, and, and we'll try and answer you as, to those questions as much as possible. So in this next section, we we'll, we go into the priorities, noting that, well, just, just to give you an idea of the structure of these reporting and the, and the different styles, we tried to include some uh, summary pages where there's very little data and there's some high level points of view. We've then got some slides where there's some data with some insights, which is also helpful. We've then gone into just the priorities. And then in the appendix, there's a there's absolutely every bit of detail you could possibly want for those of you who love the data. So um, we've tried to structure it in a way that hopefully caters to all audiences who will embrace this because we want it to be used um, as broadly as possible. So this is really about taking the priority markets and uh, giving a bit of a snapshot as to the Ws. So there's the, um, first of all, the penetration. You see quite highly penetrated, UAE number one, we saw that. The when for these markets, so breakfast, snacking and lunch seems to be the, um, the preferred time to have these, to have summer fruits. Fresh on its own is the how, and also part of a snack um, in Indonesia and UAE came up. Uh, the why taste is number one. And what's interesting here is that the core why is different across these markets. So in India, as well as taste, they're also saying that physical and mental energy is, um, is one thing that they look for as a base why, in terms of why they would pick up a summer fruit. In Indonesia, it's also about connection. So uh, a sharing fruit. Uh, so we'll get into some of the detail in a minute. And then in the UAE, health and nutrition is another core driver. So once again, interesting nuances when you decide um, if you're interested in each of these markets, you can go into the detail in the market reports. And then the where and the who with is pretty standard there, at home with family. So um, we've seen a lot that the family dynamics across the Asian markets and the multi-generational households, that comes through a lot in the results. So you'll see that uh, in many of the charts. So then we've we've summarised a little bit more around um, how those the, the Ws then translate to um, to some of the things around function, the premium opportunity, barriers and substitutes. So you can see at the top we've summarised that previous page uh, and replicated those top two, but then we go into functional attributes and um, for summer fruits, refreshing taste was really really high. It's what people look for as a as a fundamental uh, reason for picking it up, and in uh, UAE fresh and light is another one. For premium, uh, this is what people would pay a premium for. A summer fruit, fresh is the number one thing. So you need to get that uh, summer fruit fresh to consumers for them to feel that they're getting their money's worth when they pay a premium. Uh, in India, they're also looking for high in vitamins and minerals uh, and Indonesia as well. And more flavour is what UAE uh, consumers say is important when they pay a premium. And then overcoming the barriers, um, Cost or expense is a big one. So that comes up a lot. Um, so it's worthwhile looking at some of the other commodities as well and they're in this report and how that is relatively speaking. And also once again, getting back to those individual uh, commercial dynamics, uh, you'll know more uh, than that than we do. We just don't have access to all the pricing across the piece. But um, certainly when we ask this, people say it's too expensive. The poor quality and alternatives is another thing that comes up. And when people uh, look at alternatives, it's apples, mangoes, bananas, the three they're saying are they reaching for when they're not reaching for a summer fruit. So they're the summary pages. And then following that, there's all the detail which um, goes through, uh, shows you for each of the core strategic priority markets. In the appendix, all of these charts are replicated by the, the full 13. I'll also say that before we did this uh, international study, we also did a piece in Australia. So where the, question, <clears throat> where the questions are comparable, we've included the Australian outputs. And here you'll see on this page. So what's interesting here is that in Australia, 58% of consumers say that they pick up a summer fruit for a snack. 
But when you look at the other markets, it's very different, particularly in India. Uh, breakfast uh, more likely to be consumed in India. Uh, lunch as well. Um, Snacking is also very important, but you can see the different spreads and the different uh, when uh, helps. It can help understand the consumers more. And once again, there's a lot more detail on this in the country reports that you've got access to as well. And then we, we actually then open up snacking here. There's another question that we added to it. So if you look at, if people tick snacking, what type of snack, and actually this is fairly consistent, snack between lunch and dinner seems to be the, um, so that afternoon snack is where people are picking one up. How did you consume it? So um, fresh on its own, big in Australia, um, but in Indonesia, not so much. So lots of other uses. Um, so that other is things like in a salad, in baking, uh, ingredient in cooking as decoration. So um, uh, those diff the combination of those different things is in the other. You can find all the detail, by the way, in the appendix, um, but for the purposes of this um, summary page, we, we represented it like this. So in Indonesia, it's an interesting call out, quite a breadth of why and, and the, the how of consumption of summer fruits compared to the other markets, particularly Australia. Where were you? So, yeah, a lot of at home, but interestingly in other markets, so Australia 80% at home and in the other markets uh, less so. So a lot more out of home consumption of summer fruits. Uh, where did you get it from? You can see, although these are fairly a basic reporting, it was really important for your benefit that we, we reported on everything that was in the survey. So we tried to get a balance between some of the high level strategic stuff, but which we've just gone, been through, but reporting all of these key important things uh, that help you kind of guide you through um, how you might go to market, giving you a more of an understanding of how they relate. And then who were you with? Uh, once again, another interesting one we see a lot. Uh, just myself in Australia, so lots of Australians are just eating fruit on their own. But when you look across the other markets, and once again, that dynamic of the, the, the family occasion and eating, much more sharing eating occasions in Asia, uh, is coming through very strongly here. You know, mostly people are with other people when they're eating fruit uh, in other countries, but in Australia, mostly eating on their own, sadly. So then there's a whole section on the why, and this was um, based off some work we did in Australia. We did some demand modelling where we, um, we factored the different needs and why people do it. And we, we came up with six universal consumer needs pillars that um, we found to be consistent across markets. You know, people are people regardless of where they come from. The relativities uh, are different across the markets, but broadly speaking, they were the key, these were the key things that people identified as, as why they pick up fruits, vegetables and nuts. And they are taste, uh, quick and easy or convenience, uh, health and nutrition, indulgence, physical and mental energy, and connection. So that's the, they're the six core reasons why people uh, eat uh, these commodities. And for in the priority markets for summer fruit, it's taste that's very high score, right? So there's almost two thirds of people in priority markets say that uh, taste is the most important thing. So uh, that's what the, and, th and that's higher than a lot of the other commodities, by the way. So um, really important when you're selling summer fruit. 45%, uh, almost another half would say health and nutrition. And then connection. So that's that sharing nature uh, is very important. And these are just the core reasons why people pick it up. And then following that, the detail is, is, is here in the report. So that's the summary point of view. So this next page is, really how we got to that summary. So you can see there that taste, uh, and you can see how it splits across the different markets, the average and then the Australian version as well. But what's interesting about these charts is how the profiles differ. And I think what sticks out to me, whenever I look at these pages, I always look for the biggest differences. And the one that uh, jumps out most prominently for this page is that Australia connection is only 12% of the reason why people would say they consume a summer fruit. Whereas in, when you look at Indonesia, it's almost half. So summer fruit in Indonesia is really seen as a sharing connection type of fruit. So that gives you a, it gives us a real different lens and perspective uh, on, uh, on why people pick up these fruits and, and what, what we could use to go to market. Um, so yeah, some interesting, uh, I, always, I always look for the differences here and shows how they do. But if, uh, other than those two, the profiles are very similar. 
um, mainly also that there's lots more thickness down the bottom compared to Australia, actually. So there's lots more a variety of reasons why people are choosing summer fruit in the Asian markets compared to Australia. And then this is the detail again. So when you break open those uh, factors, here is an even more detailed view as to what, what that means. And you can see the in the Indonesia one, good for sharing um, breaks out as 25%. And, and then we saw that previously, that, that that goes into connection. And I can see everyone would eat it is another good thing, 19%. That's, a, that's almost one-fifth, which is very, very small in Australia. You can see that good for sharing in Australia is 5%, the lowest, and everyone would eat is only 9%. So you can see that there, there's layers of detail here, and hopefully you can navigate that uh, in your own time. So then we look at more functional things. Um, so here, refreshing taste, uh, light, fresh and light, and sweet are the key things, 28%, 23 and 20% are for sweet. And then here's the detail that goes behind that summary, uh, the summary slide. And what's interesting there is that when we talk about sweetness, uh, it's actually relatively lower in India. So in UAE and Australia, sweetness is really, really high compared to the other markets. So that's the one that, um, that jumps out a bit here. The other one that jumps out is um, rich in antioxidants uh, as a functional thing. Uh, much higher in India and Indonesia as a driver, a functional driver of choice of summer fruits, but much lower in Australia. So, um, yeah, so once again, the dimensions or the profiles here uh, are the key interesting points um, to, to take from these slides. Now onto the premium opportunity. So we asked about why would you buy premium or why would you pay a premium for summer fruits? And the number one reason, 43%, is fresh. And we see this quite a lot across fruits. You know, if you're not serving or you, if a consumer can't get something fresh, they're not willing to pay a premium for it. So it's that challenge of getting it to the consumer as fresh as possible so that you can get that premium price. Another 30% would say high in vitamins and minerals. Uh, these are across the priority markets. Uh, more flavour and safe and trusted are also important in these priority markets. And you can see how this is now the detail uh, in that premiumness. So yeah, fresh, quite significantly high there. Uh, high in vitamins and minerals, mostly important in, in India. Uh, that spikes there. It's the second highest uh, driver of premiumness. And food safety is the third in India, which is not surprising. We see that a lot across commodities. And we know that food safety is such a big driver of choice in India. And that's why they like Australian, actually. So, um, so those two things go hand in hand. And then finally, um, the price is the, um, the biggest barrier here, but not, not as big as some of the other commodities, uh, if, I, if I might add. And it's worth, you do have all the data. You can see what, what, um, how big the barrier is on price for other commodities. 26%, though that's still a quarter of the market would say it's too expensive. But also people are saying that um, there are more exciting alternatives and also the poor quality. So that is definitely something. But once again, um, that's a lot lower than some of the com other commodities that we've recently presented. So 17%, um, that's not too bad. But certainly that's something to, to overcome. If you can overcome that barrier, you'll sell more premium priced summer fruits. And, and then you stop the, uh, the movement to other substitutes, which uh, in this case is apples, mangoes and bananas. And then here's the detail. Um, once again, looking at the profiling, more exciting alternatives is coming up quite significantly in Indonesia and UAE. Uh, it might also represent uh, the, um, the myriad of alternatives of fruits that are available in those markets. So uh, yeah, it, it's hot competition. Um, the other one that's interesting is not enough people in my household like them. So um, there might be a bit of an education there, particularly in India, uh, only 16%. Uh, that's the second highest um, barrier there. So um, that would be an interesting one. Maybe getting some trial going might, might help there. UAE also pretty high. Um, and then you can see the expense at the top. And that's um, pretty high for all of them actually, including Australia. So that's the number one reason why Australians would not choose a summer fruit as well. Um, and then what else would you typically, so this is that substitute question. Um, 
strawberries is not a thing that um, that was popular in, in in India, and that's why it's not there, nor with table grapes. But um, you can see that mangoes are the big one in uh, so apples and mangoes in Indonesia are the highest, and then it's table grapes in the UAE, which is the number excuse me, number three. But um, apples and bananas still pretty big, so those core staple fruits are being chosen as an alternative instead. If you can't get yourself a, a good um, summer fruit uh, in those geographies. Okay, well, uh, and we're doing well for time here because this is the final overall slide, and and I'd left plenty of time for questions. But really, this slide is a wrap up. So taking everything that we've just talked about and putting it in one place with no data. And this is really saying, if you want to pick up one page, where to play, how to win, and these are the points. Firstly, to focus on the strategic priority markets. And this is about focusing on markets where consumers are willing to pay a premium for quality summer fruits. And in this data would show that that's Indonesia, UAE, and India. Uh, and leverage the already high appeal for Australian summer fruits uh, in Indonesia, and try and improve knowledge and appeal in UAE and India. So um, that will drive incremental growth in Australian summer fruit exports. The second point is delivering to those core needs. And for summer fruits, that's refreshing taste, health and nutrition, and good for sharing. That's that connection need that came through. And also uh, more functionally, uh, refreshing, fresh and light, rich in antioxidants, uh, and that convenient or efficient lunch or snack is the day part that, um, that you need to lend yourself to. And fresh on its own, uh, lends itself into that day part and that occasion. The third one here is leveraging the premium advantage. So to maximise the opportunity to get a premium price, we saw that fresh is the number one. We also saw flavour, high in vitamins and minerals. Um, free from pesticides came in as well, uh, a little bit lower, but safe and trusted source as well came up, particularly for India. So it gives you a bit of a ranking and uh, you can look at the more detail, particularly by market, what's more interesting to them. Particularly that organic free of pesticides, I think that was the question, which is uh, how does that land? And that's certainly in some of the detail you can find in the pack. And finally, uh, reducing those consumption barriers. And we've just talked about expense, if that's something that you can control. The poor quality, I think, is one that is within your control. Um, and we talked about route to market. Uh, there's a challenge there, but getting it to market as quickly as possible so that the quality retains itself um, is, a, is, you know, the, the, the eternal challenge for this category. Uh, but achieving uh, better quality, less expensive, then you'll stop people moving to potentially more exciting alternatives. And in this case, substitutes like apples, bananas and mangoes are the key competitors that we see coming through from the data. So I know that was a bit of a whistle stop, but hopefully it's covered a lot of ground and you've obviously got the reports, you can sift through them in detail, but I'd be happy now to just pause and uh, to get any questions. And if you'd like me to go back over any of the data or show you any of the, um, the information again uh, that you might have spotted, I'm happy to do so. Patrick, um, there is actually a question in the chat. Yeah. Um, it is, were any sustainability measures considered in terms of purchase decision? Let's go back, shall we? Give me a second. Olivia, I know you're there. You might there might be a few more um, uh, attributes here, but the one that pops out here is that when we ask people what does premium quality mean to you. We included one that was locally grown and produced in my area, which is a, you know, one of the big ones for sustainability because people kind of like that local or, or produced uh, close by. Um, there may have been more on here, uh, Jade, but I, I don't think um, they didn't certainly hit the top ten here or top nine or whatever it is. So um, I think we did have some included, but they didn't come up strongly. Actually, is is the thing. So so that's. Um, but that's locally grown and produced in my area, 22% in India, uh, but a bit less for some of the ge other geographies. Let me just check the overall one. Yeah, Olivia has mentioned that we can take that um, on notice and come back to you, Andrew, okay, if that's cool. okay. Mm. Thank you. Um, any, any other questions? 
yeah, or comments that you want to ask while we have Patrick here, you can come off mute or pop them in the chat. No, doesn't look like we have any any follow ups at the minute. Um, but as Patrick's mentioned, we've, we've put the link in the chat to the full reports that have come out from the, the Cantor study. Um, so if anyone does have any questions that come out of reading those, um, you can reach out to us and we, we can come back to you, to you on that. Um, but if there is, oh, we have some maybe, Charlotte? No, no questions. No, no. Perfect. But thank okay. you. That was very interesting. Good chart. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I was just, this is the chart that I, I guess is our favourite because it, it's um, it's it's the result of a lot of the work and inputs and the sweat and uh, we appreciate the inputs from the PRG and Hort. So, I, I, yeah, I, I was just curious and, and thank you, Charlotte, for your initial observations. I was just wondering if there are any other observations here and certainly the markets that you may be in, whether it surprises you or not, because really this, this representation really forms the, the jumping off point of where you might go and start pursuing further investigation. And uh, indeed, the next step would be if you're interested in one of these markets particularly, then the market report can give you a bit more background to that. Um, but yeah, I was just so just inviting any comments or questions, but if uh, if there are none, then we can uh, we can wrap up. But uh, yeah, just curious, is there anything more that you'd like to add? I think uh, I'm very interested in doing the deep dive because we're also um, doing our export strategy at the moment. So I think this will yeah, be definitely food for thought and, our, and for our market aspect, uh, yeah, market ask, mm -hmm. as, uh, access aspirations. So thank you Did very I, much for all the work you've done. Thanks, Charlotte. And, and Andrew, do you have your hand up there? Yeah, I do. Just um, it would this is obviously great for um, Australian summer fruits. I suppose I'll be doing a bit of a dig through your reports to see how that compares perhaps to some of the other produce, whether those same countries seem to stand out um, or whether they, they tend to swap around depending on what the actual produce is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, please have a sift around, but we did find there's, there is lots of, um, certainly the big markets, uh, we see Indonesia, India, um, Vietnam comes up a lot. Qatar is a bit more common, uh, UAE. Uh, they, they really appear quite a lot across the commodities um, for reasons that are similar in that um, a lot of these markets, there is a halo of Australia, uh, penetration's high and, and their appetite for paying a premium for quality where they may not have had it in the past is there, particularly with the, the rise of higher income households and, and emerging markets. So that's a, a factor. Uh, what's interesting also is that USA and UK, Japan and even Korea, they also end up being in a similar spot for similar reasons. I mentioned that for USA, distance to market is a big one. Tariffs across the piece, just the, the strength of local uh, production and also the, the fact that the Central and South American markets, can Canada, Mexico, the, 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 how their export is so huge. Uh, it is really hard to go after the USA. And the UK, their appetite to pay a premium is not there. They, they really, they've become used to getting anything, any time of year uh, for a good price at a good quality. So very hard to convince a UK consumer that uh, that they should pay more for something that they think they can get pretty cheaply at, at a quality. So there are some consistencies, but what we find is that the relativities are different and, and uh, hopefully... That will, that will, and actually, when you go into each of the market reports, that's then cut by commodity. So if you were to go into UAE, you'll see how the relativities of each of the commodities. So you'll get this exact same chart, say, for example, for a UAE, and all of the commodities will be represented on here as bubbles. So you can see how in a particular market, how summer fruit uh, compares when it comes to the different metrics that go into that uh, for any market. So that's an interesting lens too, Andrew, that you, you should in, yeah, uh, encourage it, you to investigate. Excellent. I suppose the surprise for me was probably seeing Japan so far low. Mm. Yeah, I, and I think that that's what we found. And there's a couple of things I'd say about that. Um, one is that um, the commercial terms, we obviously didn't have access to the you know, commercial uh, arrangements of various, you know, uh, exporters and the pricing they're getting. So this was a purely consumer point of view. So from a consumer's point of view, 
Um, it doesn't appear that relative to other markets, Australia has the same halo. So that was a reason why Japan uh, comes low. Uh, the other one is that the willingness to pay a premium uh, is not necessarily there for the Japan, noting that in many cases, uh, the exporters might be getting a good price, but we, we don't see that from the consumer side, if that makes sense. So it's getting back to that point, which is this is comes predominantly from a consumer point of view. And while there are some commercial factors here, we really encourage you to use other commercial information that we might not have access to um, to make any decisions. So it might be that Japan, from your point of view, is a good place to be, uh, but certainly from a consumer's point of view, relative to other markets, uh, there might be some other frontiers that are worth pursuing. So please keep this in mind. And also this is, this is relative. So what's exciting there is that um, for some of these other markets, while market access might be a bit harder right now, it does appear that there's a big consumer opportunity that's worth pursuing and that we would encourage you to investigate. Yeah, thanks. That's a good tip. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I've got one more a quick one. Yeah, go on. Have you got any more comments on Korea, Patrick? Yeah, well, let's have a look, shall we? Because I, I always like digging into the detail and, and understanding. I, I, I can't remember all the data for every commodity, every market, unfortunately, but that, it, because, it's, it's at my fingertips here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because there's no um, no countries have um, access for summer fruit to Korea. So it's sort of an interesting one. Oh, well, there you go. Well, like I said, this does not, um, that doesn't, if there's no market access, we haven't brought that into account. Mm. And what this would suggest is that it's probably not one worth pursuing. <laughs> and that's predominantly because penetration is low compared to some of the other more attractive markets. Uh, let's have a look at some of the other things. Um, their willingness to pay a premium is relatively low. Um, general market access is good, but to your point, not for uh, summer fruits. Uh, when we look at uh, willingness to buy Australian, very low. So, you know, there's not a halo of Australia in Korea. So, um, you know, it's much harder to realise that opportunity. And then when we look at premiumness again, similarly, it's pretty low compared to others. So you can kind of see how the data would suggest, therefore, that Korea, if you don't have current market access, it just doesn't look like somewhere where you'd be uh, wanting to invest your money, certainly in the short term. Um, that's how to read this. Um, so, yeah. I don't think I'd be recommending Korea as some place to go fishing. Thanks. We do have one more question in the chat, Patrick. So yeah, do size and firmness come into play for premium attributes? Size and firmness. Um, we have used size we couldn't use because size is relative. So it's very hard to include in a survey, remembering that this is consumer claimed. But we do have state of ripeness, and um, let me just get to that because there is something there. Right state of ripeness was an attribute in a premium quality. So um, obviously that's... Um, that's different for, you know, different things. For example, you know, obviously for avocados, you don't want it to be too hard. Um, but for a summer fruit, you do want something to be crisp and and, uh, and fresh and, and, and juicy, but not too soft. Um, so I think that's how to read this. So people, and this is really suggesting that about a quarter of people would suggest that having a fruit or a summer fruit in the right state of ripeness is a key thing here. Um, yeah, so, so we couldn't do size and, um, and firmness once again. It is a bit of a relative uh, thing or a subjective measure, I should say. Uh, not bruised or damaged came into it too, though. So that's another thing that might um, lean itself or, or, or closely align itself to that, which is not being bruised or damaged, um, which is actually relatively low as a premium thing, obviously. So, um, uh, yeah, not, not as important. But right state of ripeness is, is probably the one there. So not, not exact one for one, but a pretty good indicator from that question. So, Thank you. Um, are there any other questions while we still have Patrick here? No? 
Um, okay, well, on, uh, if there's no more questions or comments, then we can we can wrap up there. Um, so thank you, Pat and Olivia, for joining us and everyone mm -hmm. um, for coming along to hear the outcomes. Mm -hmm. Um, and yep, the, the link is in the chat for anyone that wants to access the reports and please feel free to reach out to us if, if you have any questions on there. Thanks very much. Thank you. Good. Well, thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.